Welcome. I hope you're doing well in the Lord today. In this video, we're going to start a quick uh, series on the gospel of salvation. Now, the gospel of salvation is not a different gospel than the gospel of the kingdom or the gospel of Jesus Christ. There's only one gospel, but the gospel of salvation is looking at the gospel from the perspective of how it benefits us, how it brings salvation for us. If we looked at the gospel of the kingdom, it's how the kingdom of God comes through Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that he is the king and that the kingdom of God has come through him. So we're looking here at the gospel of salvation. We're going to start in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In him... You also, after hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and after believing in him, were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Now, we've talked about these issues before, uh, but I'm here in our ministry. We've had opportunity to teach a short one-time class on the gospel of salvation, and so I've been putting some notes together, so I thought it would be helpful just to put uh, this out as a series. Now, the series, I'll try to uh, clump them all together, so hopefully consecutive days we can put them out so we don't have to wait uh, for the, the end uh, I have to wait weeks to, to hear the conclusion of the matter. Uh, but let's go ahead and turn first to Psalm chapter 7. Because if we want to understand the gospel of salvation, we first have to understand the fact that what the problem is, what it is that we're being saved from, why it is that we need to be saved. And so we need to understand the problem that is being dealt with. So Psalm chapter 7. So in chapter 7, verse 11, we read, God is a righteous judge, and God has indignation every day, or he's filled with wrath every day. So God is a righteous judge. He, God has indignation every day. This means that God is not willing to allow rebellion to take place. He's not willing to overlook sin, but he must deal with sin. In his heart, he hates sin, he hates rebellion, and so he's going to deal with it. God is not willing to overlook sin. We see in verse 12, if one does not repent, God will sharpen his sword. He has bent his bow and made it ready. So we see that God is ready to judge the wicked, that he's angry all day long, that he's filled with indignation every day, and that he is a righteous judge. A righteous judge will not overlook sin. It will not wink at sin, but a righteous judge will look at sin and come with wrath upon it. This is what righteousness does. Now here it says that, if one does not repent, God will sharpen his sword, and he has bent his bow and made it ready. So that implies that if one does repent, that God will show mercy. God is willing to show mercy to the wicked if they will turn from their rebellion, but not until they turn from the rebellion. If they remain in the rebellion, God is ready to strike them down. If we flip over to Nahum chapter 1, we read this in verse 2. The Lord is a jealous and an avenging God. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord takes vengeance on his enemies, and he reserves it for his adversaries. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will in no way acquit the guilty. In the gales of winds and a storm is his way, and clouds are the dust of his feet. So the Lord will in no way acquit the guilty. The Lord is filled with vengeance, and he's ready to avenge. He's furious towards his enemies. So we see that this is the character of a righteous God, that he does not wink at sin. He is not willing to overlook sin. And so that we note that this is also the same in the new covenant as well as in the old, that God has not changed. We'll flip over here to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and we see this in verse 7. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. They shall be punished with eternal destruction, isolated from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. So we see that he's coming with flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of of our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is the first part of the problem when we're talking about the salvation of mankind. Uh, we're talking about the fact that God is a righteous judge, that he is angry all day, that he is not willing to uh, overlook the rebellion of the wicked. He's not willing to turn a blind eye or to wink at sin, but that he is a righteous judge that is ready to judge the wicked if they will not repent. So the first part of the problem is that God is not willing to overlook the rebellion of wicked men, but he is a righteous judge and will judge them. But if we turn over to 1 John, 
chapter three, we're going to see the second part of the problem, which is going to be from our side of things. First John chapter three, verse four. Whoever practices sin breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness. Whoever practices sin breaks the law, for sin is lawlessness. So when we ask the question, what is sin? Sin is rebellion against God. It's transgression against God's commands, against his laws. As we see uh, Jesus said in Luke chapter 6, verse 46, he says, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, but not do what I command? And so we will stand before the judgment seat of Christ, and we will give an account. Because to be a disciple of Christ means that we, we turn from rebellion, we submit to Jesus Christ, and we learn to obey all that he has commanded. That's in the Great Commission in Matthew chapter 28. So we need to understand that sin is living in rebellion to the law of Jesus Christ, to living in rebellion to him. But if we go to Romans chapter 3, verse 3, a very familiar passage. Romans chapter 3, verse 3. I'm sorry, 3, verse 23. Uh, we reread this. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So all men have sinned. Everyone has sinned against God. Everyone has rebelled against his law. And so we see that that is dangerous. And the wages of sin is death. Uh, we read that if we go over to uh, 6 verse 23. 6 verse 23. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. For the wages of sin is death. So... Because we've all sinned, we are all destined to die because of our sin. But not only that, but it says in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27, that each man is appointed to die once, and then after death comes the judgment. And we read in Matthew chapter 25, verse 46, Jesus speaks of what will happen to those that live in rebellion to him or those that walk in, in obedience to him. Those that live in rebellion to him on that day. Let's go ahead and turn there. Matthew chapter 26. I'm sorry, 25, verse 46, speaking of the two different camps, those that submit to the law of Christ and those that rebel against it. And they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So there will be eternal punishment for the wicked. So they will die because of their sin. They will be judged in their sin, and they'll be cast into eternal punishment because of their sin. So the wages of sin is death means much more that we're just going to physically die, but that after that we face the judgment. So this is indeed a great problem, that men have sinned against God, a righteous God that's not willing to overlook rebellion, and because of that, men are under the wrath of God. Uh, now, we, we might ask this question. If sin is just disobeying God's command, What's so bad about that? I mean, we might say, well, I mean, it's just a you know, one-time mistake or 10-time mistake or a 100-time mistake. We can consider this. We can think about Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve, because they sinned one time, they ate a fruit. All they did was eat some fruit. Because they ate fruit one time, because of that, not only did they die, all of their children, all of their descendants were going to be put to death. Not only that, but uh, all the wars, all the famines, all the earthquakes, all the... Uh, you know, disease that has taken place in history has been because they one time ate of a fruit. And for us, that might look like, man, that's just too extreme. I mean, it was just disobeying a command. But we need to understand what was happening in that garden. They were given authority over everything that God had created. They were meant to represent God and to be his representatives on earth, that they were going to be like kings on the earth ruling for God. And he gave them all authority over everything that he had created, except one thing. He told them that they must submit to him, and the way to do that was by not eating of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Everything else they could eat of, but not that. And so Satan came and tempted them with the same temptation that, had, that, that Satan had in his own heart which was namely that he wanted to be like God. So he came and tempted them and said, if you eat this, you will become like God. And so them eating the fruit was not merely them disobeying a command, but it was them choosing to follow their own will, their own way. It was them choosing to follow Satan's way and to serve him and to serve their own desires and to said, instead of serving the living God. And every time we have sinned against God, we have done the same thing. 
And it's not just that we, oh, I, I, I messed up on that or I did this thing. No, we were choosing that we were going to follow our own will instead of the will of God. This is rebellion. This is like Adam and Eve and like Satan himself wanting to be like God. And so we have lived our lives when we, uh, before we knew Christ, we lived in our lives in rebellion to God, seeking to make ourselves as God and to sit on the throne of our own lives. And so this was the rebellion. And this is why the punishment is so severe, because it's coming against a, not only a holy and righteous God, but against a good and a loving God that provided everything for Adam and Eve and provided everything for us and coming instead and saying, no, I don't want anything to do with you. I want to do things my way. I want to live how I want to live. This is utter rebellion. It's a satanic rebellion against the living and good God. But if we turn to John chapter 8, we will see that our problem is even worse than the fact that we are under the wrath of a holy God. Of course, that is very bad, but uh, there's something that even kind of more makes even more despair in the situation. If we turn to John chapter 8, verse 34. Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Now, a slave does not remain in the house forever, but a son remains forever. So it says a slave does not remain in the house forever. In other words, he's going to be cast out. Jesus is going to say, I never knew you. Those that walk in sin, they will be cast out away from Jesus Christ. Those that did not obey the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it says, truly, I say to you, whoever uh, commits sin is a slave of of sin. So the problem with sin that we have in our lives is not merely that we've sinned and we've offended a righteous and holy God, but it's also that we have enslaved ourselves to the bondage of sin. We have made ourselves slaves to our own desire, to our own uh, carnal uh, wishes and wants, and instead of following the living God, we follow after our own desires. And so we become in bondage to sl- uh, in slavery to sin. If we turn to 8 44, because we might think, oh, well, that's, that's kind of something to be pitied. I mean, poor, poor human beings, they've, they've sinned, and now they're in this situation, and they've got this disease of sin in themselves. You know, that's a sad thing. But if we see verse 44, we'll recognize that man, including you and me, are not worthy of being pitied. In verse 44, Jesus, speaking to the Pharisees, said, You are of your father the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks from his own nature, for he is a liar and the father of lies. So I want to foc- what I want to focus on here is it says, you are, the father, you are of your father the devil. Just like I said before, we followed after Satan. We lived in rebellion to God, and we sought to be God just like Satan did. And you want to do the desires of your father. So the way to illustrate this is that it's not merely that uh, we have sinned and become slaves to sin, and now we want to be out, but yeah, we just we don't, can't figure a way out. Uh, it's not that, but it's that we want to be enslaved to sin. We, we're enslaved to sin because we love sin, because we love having our own way, doing our own will. And this is what the bondage to sin means. It would be the comparison I've made in the past is imagine a guy uh, is sitting there and he's a soldier and he's sitting and somebody comes and chains him up on a chair. Maybe it's the, his commander comes and chains him up and he locks him tight on a chair. And the, then the commander comes to him and says, now stand up, get up, stand up right now. And the, the, the soldier tries to get up, but he can't get up. And then the, the commander gets very angry with him. Why didn't you get up? I commanded you to get up. And so, of course, the soldier would be pitied in that situation because it's not his fault he can't get up. That's not our situation with sin. Instead, God comes to us, and he commands us to get up out of the chair. But we're like those sitting in the chair with no chains. The only chains we have are the fact that we feel very, very comfortable in the chair. We don't want to move. We don't want to get up. We don't want to change our position. We feel so comfortable. We like it so much that we say, sorry, Commander, I just can't. I can't do it. And can't means won't because don't want to. And that's what it means here. You are of your father, the devil. You and you want to do the desires of your father. This is our bondage. Our bondage is self-inflicted. This disease that we have is something that we, by our own will, have chosen to be in bondage and slavery to sin. This is why Jesus said, he who overcommits sin is a slave to sin, because they are giving themselves over to it. And as we've lived years and years in sin, following after the desires of our flesh, 
our body and our mind, as we've been seeking after those fleshly desires, we become it's become ingrained in us. Something like whenever the Israelites came up out of Egypt and they were longing for the food that was from Egypt. Now they weren't originally from Egypt. Uh, they were the, the descendants of Abraham that got taken as slaves into Egypt, but they've got adapted to the culture and the surrounding of Egypt, and they longed for the food of Egypt. So even when they were brought out of their slavery, they were still longing after the food, the, the garlic and the leeks and, you know, the, the meat and all the different things that they had available to them in Egypt, they still longed for that. And we, as we've given ourselves to sin, we become enslaved to sin because that is what we are used to. That's the culture of our heart. That's the desire that we have. And so we become in bondage and enslaved to sin. So this problem that we have, it's on one, it's a problem that God is not willing to overlook rebellion and to wink at sin. He's a righteous judge that's filled with anger every day. But secondly, that we've sinned against this holy God. And because of that, we're under his wrath. But we're not only under his wrath, how can we get out? Because our hearts desire sin, our hearts desire wickedness. And so we have no way to free ourselves from this bondage and this slavery to sin. But the problem gets a little bit worse. Okay, let's go to Ezekiel. In this first video, we're just going to be covering the problem. But we're going to run over here to Ezekiel chapter 33. Let's look at verse 11. As God speaking to the wicked of Israel says, Say to them, As I live, says the Lord, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but rather that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why will you die, O house of Israel? So it's not just that our condemnation is a problem for us. It is also a problem for God because God does not desire the death of the wicked. He does not desire anybody to be lost and to, uh, to perish, but he desires all to come to repentance and to the knowledge of the truth and salvation and life in Jesus Christ. This is his desire. And so we can say that the sin of man is our problem because we're under the condemnation of God and the bondage of sin, but it's also God's problem because God created us and desires to bless us. He doesn't desire for us to perish. He doesn't desire for us to go into the lake of fire that was prepared for the original enemy. He doesn't want us to follow after his enemy, but to follow after him, to glorify his son, to live in fellowship with God. And this is his desire. He takes no pleasure in the death of the wicked. Yes, he's ready to judge the wicked because he is a righteous judge, but he would rather that they turn and they live. And this brings up another issue because from the beginning of this video, you know, I, I've made it clear that God is not willing to, uh, to overlook the rebellion of the wicked, but he demands that they turn away from their sin. They turn back from the rebellion. And so the thought can be, well, okay, then as long as somebody turns back from the rebellion, then God will forgive them. Yes, God is willing to forgive those that turn back. That is very clear. That's throughout the, the scripture. We see it right here, that, that if they will turn back, that they will live. But there's another problem we must consider for God. It's not just that he is not, uh, uh, that he is not willing to uh, overlook wickedness and sin, but if we turn to Psalm 89, we will see another problem. Psalm 89, verse 14. Psalm 89, verse 14 says, Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Mercy and truth shall go before your presence. So, it goes something like this. If God were to welcome back the repentant sinner, forgive their sins, even though they've rebelled against him, and welcome back. This is something that he's willing to do. This is something he longs to do. But if he does that, then that puts his kingdom at, uh, in jeopardy. It puts the foundation of his throne, which are righteousness and justice, in jeopardy because the question becomes, wait a second, this man has lived in rebellion, this man has lived in, in uh, opposition to God's will, but now he can just come back and receive forgiveness? that there's no consequences to sin. And so the whole of God's kingdom, which is founded on righteousness and justice, would then be in question. It, does God really care about sin? Does God really hate sin? Or as long as we do it for a while and then turn back at the very end, everything is going to be okay. And so we see that it's not just that God is not willing 
to uh, overlook the rebellion of somebody walking in the rebellion, but he's also unable, because of his righteous throne, because of his righteousness and the kingdom that he rules over all angels, all men, all creatures, because he rules over all of them, then he must do rightly. And a kingdom that has no consequence for sin then also has no uh, uh, fear of wickedness. It has no... uh, it's it's built on unrighteousness. It's not built on the law of God. It's not built on righteousness. And so there's a problem for God. Not only that he wants us to repent, but even if we do repent, how can God justly receive us back? How can he forgive our sins and wash away everything that we've done, welcoming us and giving us eternal life, even though we've rebelled against his kingdom? And all the creatures, whether it be angels or demons, all the creatures that have been created will see and say, wait a second, there's something wrong in a kingdom that people can do wickedly and face no consequences. And so this is a problem. One, that God is not willing to overlook sin. Somebody must return and repent. But even if they turn and repent, that God, because of the foundation of his throne, righteousness and justice, he cannot just overlook sin. There must be consequence for the sin. Secondly, we see that the the problem is our sin itself, that we have rebelled against God, we have broken his commandments, and the wages of sin is death, and that means eternal punishment from God. But not only that, we have also been in, made ourselves in bondage to sin. By habitual practice, we have become enslaved to sin, and so we are slaves. And a slave will not enter the Father's house forever, but will be cast out and rejected forever. So this is the original problem. We will get to in the following video, and again, I, I'll try to put that out right away so that we can uh, not make it linger too long. But the problem is this. From God's side and from our side, sin is the problem. And God has to deal with this sin in such a way that he can justly forgive those that turn back to him. He's not willing to forgive people that won't turn back. But if they do turn back, there needs to be a way that he can justly receive them and forgive their sins and set them free from the bondage and the power of sin. And so we'll look at that in the next video, God willing. God bless.